can always imagine Magic Dirt having their own separate world and you just you can't see that with some bands. Some bands come together, write, do tour, do those things. But Magic Dirt, you imagine it's Magic Dirt's world and uh, we just get to watch it fly by. If there's one Australian band over the last decade that has done things their way and their way only, it's Magic Dirt. A lot of bands don't seem to be able to run like we do, which is just... The first priority is what we feel like doing. Briefly known as the Jim Jims, Magic Dirt formed in 1992 in Geelong. Geelong's an industrial, working-class city about an hour's drive south of Melbourne. The music scene there has long centred on guitar rock. It was a huge scene down there and it was the Bowen Club, you know, fits about 300 people, but it was always packed, there was always rock bands and um, people were just mental, were just going crazy, you know, and that's kind of what really, what we really fed off when we were starting, like, Magic Dirt. And in Geelong, bands of the early 90s were making music purely for fun. Most of the members of Magic Dirt were pretty green. Adelita Serson and Dean Turner, both in their early 20s, were in a relationship and had once played together in a band called Dear Bubbles. The earliest recordings I've got, oh wow, was um, my first band, Dear Bubbles. Deer as in a uh, deer in the forest. Oh, OK, yeah. right. What sort of like, style? Real, like, pop. Like, really weird pop. At just 17, Magic Dirt was drummer Adam Robertson's first band. Guitarist Daniel Herring completed the lineup. The four-piece took to the stages of their hometown with a ferocity few bands could match. Um, they weren't, but it was pretty freeform. Adelita was, uh, she wasn't so much playing guitar as surfing on it and jumping on it. The distortion and unusual guitar tunings drew comparisons with Sonic Youth. It reminded me of when I read descriptions of early Patti Smith um, and everyone sort of brought up these Sonic Youth comparisons and things, but it, to me it was always this sort of Patti Smith, um, just words coming out with such such ferocious conviction to them and um, just amazing imagery in amongst uh, all the noise and what was going on. Not always sounding sweet to the ears, the passion and intent of the band was undeniable. It was the charisma that was just amazing. I was just so spellbound by this young woman who had such strong words spurting out of her mouth. Within no time at all, a strong vibe surrounded the band. Geelong bands were largely suspicious of the mainstream industry. So Magic Dirt were careful when it came to sending out their first demo tape. They chose just two names. Steve Pavlovich at the then Sydney label called Fellaheen and Bruce Milne at the reputable Agogo Records in Melbourne, which was home to Spiderbait and The Meanies. I didn't think we'd put out a record that would sell a crack, but I was, I absolutely wanted to work with them from the first time I saw them. I dragged everyone along to their next gig. Fellaheen got the first bite of the cherry, agreeing to release Magic Dirt's debut single called Super Tear. Through Pavlovich's touring company, Magic Dirt also supported Sonic Youth and Pavement in the first half of 93. By the time Super Tear came out, though, midway through 93, Magic Dirt were no more. Driven mad by the hype meter reaching 11, all the unsolicited feedback from the over-attentive A&R reps had ultimately got to the band. They knew what they were doing and they didn't need any outside advice. Once things quietened down, the band regrouped and started rehearsing again. The whole Geelong thing was so casual too. I mean, I think it's one of the things that kept Magic Dirt... Um uh, well, probably in some ways held them back and uh, kept, but also kept them very real. Was that their friends in Geelong very much uh, would cut them down to size if they start, started to think they were becoming uh, rock stars. The band then linked up formally with Milne and the Go Go Records. By the time we actually signed Magic Dirt properly, they had probably been approached by every record label in the country. When we started the band, we were only just starting to write songs because it started out just as noise pieces. And Bruce Milne and a few other dudes picked up on it right away, you know, probably picked up on ad songwriting, you know, first, is um, that there was just something there. In January 94 came the Signs of Satanic Youth EP, featuring tracks like Touch That Space and the catchy Redhead. Getting into
to the promotional slog of interviews and making film clips, though, was the furthest thought from the band's mind. They didn't like the, the way the music industry works as an industry. They wanted to do things their own way, and if everyone could fit in around that, fine. Just when the future seemed bright, the band again imploded. The reason this time was the end of Adelita and Turner's relationship. When Dean and Adelita broke up, um, I thought the band would fall to bits. What got them through that relationship situation? Dean's a beautiful person and he, he realised that he was, you know, he was better as, as, as uh, Adelita's friend. And that gave them a strength that they trusted each other like brother and sister after that. Over the rest of 94, the pieces of Magic Dirt were put back together and the band returned in November with another EP. Titled Life Was Better, it made Magic Dirt the most exciting new band on the scene, alongside You Am I, critic Craig Matheson. They were just the band. They were electrifying. They had that great thing about a band where they just appeared and they were wild and electrifying and, God, you did not know what would happen at their show. The EP ended up selling over 20,000 copies and Magic Dirt had quickly become one of the label's star acts. 1995 looks set to be the breakthrough year for the band and not just on a national level. Jeffrey Weiss was vice president of A&R at Warner Brothers in the States. Having worked in the industry in Australia in the 80s, he had made enough friendships in the business to keep him in touch with the music scene here. He had two bands in mind to sign up, You Am I and Magic Dirt. He knew Adelita was a compelling front woman and he described them as a great band from another planet. With a bit more sheen, Weiss thought songs like Ice were sure to be irresistible to American radio. Ice in your eyes. Weiss's presence at Magic Dirt's gigs at the 95 Big Day Out sent out the signal to other labels. Milne, along with the band's manager, Gavin Purdy, started meeting with interested parties in Los Angeles. I, I've known Jeff for so many years. I actually knew that I was gonna, we were going to sign with Warners. I just uh, was making it uh, more expensive for Warners all the time, really. What they weren't divulging then, though, was Daniel Herring's desire to leave the band. The stoic guitarist, who often played crouched over his guitar with his back turned to the audience, was uncommitted about the band's future. The danger, as Milne and Purdy both knew, was that if he left, the band could just as likely throw in the towel too. If we hadn't found um, some of those people like that, I don't think the band would still be going, you know, because they were 100% behind whatever we wanted to do. The situation dragged on for most of 95. Herring was finally confronted by Purdy to decide his fate, and he opted out. It was a, a very beautiful sound that Daniel brought. He, he loved re rehearsing with the band, he liked recording, but anything to do with the rest of it. Standing in front of a lot of people he didn't enjoy. The band chose to stay together and signed the Warners deal. The money being thrown at them was enormous. Herring's replacement was Dave Thomas. Thomas was a veteran of the Geelong scene, having played with Board for about six years. He had even unofficially managed Magic Dirt in their early days. When it came time to start laying down tracks for their debut album in Geelong, the band reacted against the accessibility of their first two EPs. It was a heavy and dark journey. When Weiss heard the finished tapes, he was concerned and flew straight from LA to Melbourne to meet with the band. He described the album to them as being impenetrable and difficult for the casual listener. Magic Dirt was proud with what they had achieved and when Weiss offered more money for extra recording sessions, the band was not impressed. Warners relented and released the album, Friends in Danger, as it was. It was there, we're on a major label, but we don't want to be on a major label sort of record. Um, and they should have grown up a bit by then. It came out here in September 96 and scared off some of the punters who had got into them via the relatively catchy songs from their EPs. Sparrow proved the only radio-friendly track, but once again the band refused to make a video for it. They weren't adverse to making film clips, they just... Uh they didn't want to make the film clips that uh, TV 
stations wanted to play. But they hated the ice clip. And I can see the band's point. They were a band and the clip featured Adelita and that's not what the intention was. Was that the one where she was wearing gold lame? Yes, she was wearing gold lame and, and they did a lot of scenes where the band was playing and they got sort of edited down to three or four seconds of the clip. The album ended up selling 10,000 copies in Australia. In the States, Warner's put little effort into promoting it. When the band toured there with Arches of Loaf, late in 96, there was no game plan in place to push the album. The label had virtually written it off. This is our last one. Thanks a lot for watching us, uh, it's called Friends in Danger. See you later, have a good day. The band's shows ranged from the mesmerising to the messy, and Magic Dirt returned home quietly. Unsurprisingly, Magic Dirt was dropped by Warner Brothers. It was an enormous deal by anyone's standards, and it guaranteed that Warners would back them on two albums they couldn't pull out after the first album. Um, Warners chose to back out after the first album, so they had to pay 100% of the money for the second album, even though they knew they weren't going to release it. Having already recorded their second full-length CD themselves in Melbourne, it was money in the bank. And a lot of money at that. I, you know, I have to also say, the band didn't go into it trying to sting the record label for money. They were always very straight up about, you know, we're going to do it our way. The naivety was, was on our side and, and Warner Brothers in not realising when they meant their way, they really meant their way. It wasn't their rock and roll swindle. Um, in retrospect, it, it, it may have seemed that way, but no, it, it certainly wasn't. Recorded with new guitarist Raul Sanchez, who had replaced Thomas, Young and Full of the Devil followed on from their debut in its rawness of sound and emotion. She Riff was an immediate standout. Selling once again 10,000 copies, their second album was their last on a go-go. Milne had left the company, and the band knew it was time to push their career to another level. Drawing on the money from their Warner's payout, Magic Dirt toured and started writing their third album. I just wanted to write something really immediate. I was really focused. I had no time to dilly-dally or piss fart around. Um, so I was just writing really snappy short songs. Labels were wary of dealing with them. Their reputation was one of hardheads who sneered at commerciality. Anyone that wasn't interested or didn't have any time or respect for what we were doing, they just didn't come to the table. Musically, though, Magic Dirt's new material was sounding more like the sharp and edgy pop of their early recordings. Still with no home, the band also parted ways with their longtime manager and signed on with Powderfingers Management. By 2000, they had found a label willing to take them on. Ironically, it was the Australian arm of Warner Music. This is a band who's been, you know, repeatedly told you can be huge if you just do this or that and they've never even paused to consider those questions. They would rather, I'm sure, you know, sell 10,000 albums of an album they love to make than sell 100,000 copies of an album they felt was tarnished in some way with outside concern. Stripped back and far more focused, the new songs offered more polish than before. The pop sensibility many had seen in the band from the start was resurfacing. I think we always yeah. liked it. It was just, yeah. um, it was probably a bit too easy just to, you know, try and concentrate on that stuff. Because when we started, the songs just came out kind of poppy and catchy, but there was all this other stuff in our heads that we wanted to do. And I was like, OK, well, you know, songs like Amoxicillin, that can just wait for a little while, you know, and let's do this other stuff. But now it's kind of gone to a circle where doing the dirges and the feedback kind of feels a little bit boring. Demoing their material with producer Greg Wales brought one song quickly into shape. Well, he basically created Dirty Jeans, pretty much. You know, we wrote it, yeah. but he structured it, put hand claps in and made it into that kind of you know, funky little pop song, whatever. When it came time to lay down the album, Englishman Phil Vinyl was selected as producer. His work with Elastica and Placebo appealed to the band. Yeah, he did the singles off the last Placebo record. And it was basically only, only those two songs that just made us go, yeah, this guy's got something interesting going on. When the light-hearted Dirty Jeans film clip hit TV screens, long-time fans of the band were thrown into shock. When we saw it, like, we saw the rush of it, I was just like, I fell on the floor laughing. I could, everyone was just cracking up. It was really funny. So I didn't think it was going to be that funny. Some screamed sellout, 
which did eventually upset the band. They're a bit sus what Magic Dirt are doing at the moment, but um, I think that's really of no concern. Um, but for me, I'm really bad with criticism of any sort. <laughs> I just can't hack it at all. Adelita's vocals had started to shine in the studio. Yeah, I feel really confident with my voice and I'm learning to use it in different ways all the time, so it's not just sort of stagnating on this one kind of style. So. A national support slot on Powderfingers tour in October coincided with the album's release. Titled What A Rock Star's Doing Today, it was greeted by Juice magazine with a 9 out of 10 review. The magazine's editor, Samantha Claude, also named them the best band in the country. Well, I think that they've pretty much refined what they've always done, which is produce sort of edgy, dangerous music that a lot of Australian bands pretty much don't do. But I just think that they are a really exciting band, and I think that what more do you want from rock and roll than to just be excited by it? Magic Dirt's road so far has taken every twist imaginable. The dedication and single-mindedness of its members appears to have got them through the hardest part. Now, hopefully, the smooth sailing won't blunt the band's character. They have never made music to make money, and they've kept it that pure way more than other bands um, have, have made um, concessions. And it's taken 10 years where it might have taken another band six months to get to, to where they are now. A lot of our peers that are still going and still making new records and sort of reinvent, reinventing themselves and stuff like that, so that's really good. But I just feel lucky that I'm still around. I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm on the J's, <laughs> getting played, whatever. I feel really lucky. The J Files.